Murray comes to us from the wonderful world of iCrag and building on a lot of what we've heard this morning, but in fact, nobody's really mentioned it yet, is one of the aspects of mining that is perhaps one of the most difficult, and that is how on earth do you responsibly close that mine? Because we are extracting non-renewable resources from the ground, we don't have any intention of putting back all of those materials as we found them, but how do you leave that patch of land in the same or if not better state in which we found it? So Murray, I'm going to hand over to your wonderful self. Ladies and gents, please put your hands together for the fantastic Murray Hitzman. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you, Sarah. I'm actually not going to talk so much about the closure. I'm going to talk about the initial part. Um, so this is a history lesson from 31 years ago. And, and I want to thank speakers earlier this morning, Hugo, for, for showing us you know, how actually transitions are occurring and very quickly in the industry and, and how we're doing it. And Andy for actually having the real question of, of how do we actually deal with materials long term. And one of the things I guess I hope that happens is we certainly have to find ways of extracting that, that are very economic so the people doing it can make serious money and the societies that's around it can actually benefit and are the less least disruptive. So I think we have a real challenge going forward. And I'm just gonna show you a, an example from a long time ago and see if it teaches anything. So part of this is a history lesson. I was working at the time for Chevron this was back in the 1980s and we had come in in June. We worked across the country. I was an American working in a different country. Uh, I hired a lot of Irish consultants. I was the only person from Chevron uh, doing the project on the ground. Uh, we worked in central Ireland, the Midlands, what we called the Dublin Basin for several years. And then in January, uh, a deposit discovery was announced at Galmoy. And we very quickly actually came down and looked at this area and started extending our work through the area. And uh, I looked at the drill core in June, sort of six months afterwards. Are my slides being shared? No, they're not at the moment, Murray. You took okay, them off. Okay, let, let, let me, I thought I had, so let me escape and share them. Can you see them now? Not quite yet, but I'm sure they will come with time. Okay, just a second. No, there's, there's a real problem then if they're not there. Let me do it again. So just while Murray is, is sharing his slides, as you can hear, Murray has huge experience. Here we go, Murray, they're beginning to come now. Um, huge great. experience um, with regards to all of this area. So this is a brilliant history lesson. Thank you very much, Murray. And we can see right. your slides. <laughs> great, good. Okay, so we started in Central Ireland. And Galmoy was found, we came down, I looked at it six months afterwards, started talking to the company about a joint venture, but we also applied for ground around. Historically, we found there was a large anomaly to the north of Galmoy, which the operators didn't know about. We shared that. And we also found there was another anomaly after we had acquired the ground here to the west and south. And so in 1987, uh, when we could actually have the licenses that got on the ground, we covered it with uh, geophysics and with some geochemistry. And basically at this point, we had almost very, very little impact, obviously talking to the farmers about where the geophysical lines went and doing the geochemistry. So we identified Lachine by the end of September, 1987. But then between 1988 and 1990, Chevron got cold feet, cut back exploration. I was moved back to Canada and um, basically nothing happened. In March 1990, we signed a joint venture with a small Irish group um, to basically explore Lachine. That was the highest priority target. So in March, I came back and we started drilling. Our first drill hole hit this, this weird looking rock over here, which we now call Black Matrix Pressure, which had a touch of zinc in it. And we then decided to actually drill on every side of this hole 500 meters away to see which direction we should vector. So we drilled to the south and hit the same sort of rock. That was good, still not much zinc. We drilled to the north and hit a little bit of this red stuff, which we've seen at other ore deposits in Ireland. And we drilled to the east and we lost the hole um, and it was abandoned before hitting the target. We drilled to the west and found that it was unmineralized. We also drilled to the far south where we had another geophysical anomaly and found that the target horizon was very close to the surface so there had to be some sort of fault between our initial drilling area and this hole down here. So in uh, late March, early April, 
Another hole was sighted basically 500 meters to the south within a farmer's field shown here in orange. A farmer was a great guy. And so we, I asked him uh, where do we want to drill in all four corners of this field, which one should we drill first? He picked the Southeast because it was the same time of year as now. And basically uh, it was very wet. And that corner of the field was the highest and the driest. So he picked the uh, discovery hole. Uh, that hole began drilling the last week of March. Um, that same week, uh, Chevron announced it was getting out of the minerals business. And so I was recalled to Vancouver. Uh, basically, I was about to be fired. So I was looking for a new job and uh, interviewing. Um, the hole actually collared very high in the stratigraphy, so he knew it was going to be a deep hole. On April 3rd, the hole penetrated uh, two meters of semi-massive sulfides and entered that same black matrix pressure rock contained uh, sulfides. I uh, talked by phone to the person who'd just come from the rig. Uh, they thought there was some sphalerite in the hole. Turns out the sphalerite of the machine is very pale, and so he mistook it for dolomite. He thought it might be in an economic intersection, uh, but as the, the drilling was stopped at six o'clock that evening, I had him describe the core to me. It sounded pretty good, so uh, I broke off my job interviews, and on April the 3rd, got an airplane to London and to Dublin. Uh, the hole was completed while I was in the air, and it actually intersected six meters of 15% zinc and 4.3 meters of almost 30% zinc, so it was clearly a pretty good uh, hole. We then decided to drill a step-out hole, and I wanted to continue 500-meter step-outs. We drilled to the north of that discovery hole. The farmer picked that hole. I asked him which of the three remaining holes he'd like to drill. He picked that one next, and it ended, ended up being a duster. It almost nothing. Uh, so Arvernia, the joint venture partner, got uh, cold feet, and we actually uh, initially had 10 meter step outs, which I eventually got to 30 meter step outs from the original hole. By the end of June, we had two rigs, um, and then we increased to 60 meters, and at the end of 1990, we went to 120 meters, and we had three rigs. In the spring of 1991, with the big step outs, we would actually finally find the guts of the deposits uh, down near the fault to the south. And from this point on, we had significant local impacts, uh, basically on the traffic in the area, which were all very small roads. And during that spring, we also found another ore body uh, called the Dairyville. So just on a map, uh, here's the original holes. Here's the discovery hole. Here's the hole in the northeast corner that missed. You can see it's surrounded by what later became the deposit. Um, and by the end of the year, we, by 1991, we'd gotten down here and found the main part. So the resource stood at 15 million tons of 12.5% zinc, clearly looking like it's gonna be economic. So what was happening on the social side? So environmental monitoring was started in June. We drilled the discovery hole in April uh, at the site and we rented a local house and put in an environmental field uh, equipment and weather station, et cetera. We started looking at the land tenure situation at, uh, at the end of June when we had a second rig come on, because in Ireland, people can't own mineral rights themselves as well as the state. We had a number of locals hired as laborers for the drilling and for our geophysical consultants. And our first locals that were really technical people were hired for logging and geotechnical work. And we were training them. They came on board at the end of that first year, 1990. We had consultations taking place basically on a daily basis with many of the local farmers regarding siting of drill holes. And while we wanted to drill in a regular grid, of course, you know, there were a whole bunch of reasons why we couldn't do that. Farmers had things in various parts of the field. There were houses, et cetera. So we worked with them to accommodate their wishes. And by this point, most of the uh, permitting and talking to the farmers was not myself. It was actually locals we'd hired that helped us. A local building was purchased and converted to a core store and a laboratory at the end of the year. So by 1991, we had five drill rigs operating. We had locals hired to permit the holes, ensure water lines to the drilling were in place, not hindering farmers. And we had one individual who became a mediator, uh, <laughs> harking back to the talk we heard just a couple of minutes ago. A second house was leased for a larger field office in the immediate area. And a house was rented in Thurless, the near biggest local town for our geologists. The joint venture during 1991 hired a huge number of engineering, environmental, hydrologic, and social experts to help us prepare the EIS. 
Um, and we had monthly meetings of that group starting in June. A town hall was held in Temple Tui, the local village, and a meeting room in our bigger field office was open to the public to answer questions or for those seeking information. And a number of people actually came to that office sort of between June and November, um, but then it started petering out. So people sort of understood what was happening. We had printed information, originally a monthly newsletter on the project that was prepared and sent to over 30 local county and national groups to explain what we were doing. And we had a whole host of local groups including the Irish Country Women's Association, uh, the Irish Farmers Association, several local angling groups, the GAA, local parishes, et cetera. And we were in regular contact with Tipperary County Council and a whole number of other government groups as well. And importantly, uh, there were groups that were concerned with mining. There was an anti-mining group at Galmoy just up the road. We actually interacted with them. And there was an anti-mining group in the Wicklows, which we invited to see the project as well. And at that time, Greenpeace was active in the country, so they were invited too. From 1992 to 1993, there was a continuation of the on-ground interaction, a lot more hiring of locals. Oh, let me just go back and say, I hate to say, we, we literally drilled in people's backyards too, and front yards as well, uh, obviously with permission. Um, in 1992 to 1993, the newsletter was discontinued due to an apparent lack of interest, but we did still have an open door policy at the field office. Fewer and fewer visitors came, but that was okay, it was open. Chevron itself, uh, as a part of the joint venture, worked proactively with the government agencies on the environmental requirements, and I'll come to that in a minute. And by mid-1992, we had a very large team, about 350 people, technical people, working on this project, and regular meetings of the project team with the county council and with Irish government officials. And the image here, actually, which shows the ore bodies in red, the brown is bog, which was worked by Board Namona for peat, this actually has the, the original the mine on it. You'll notice the tailings facility, which is this blue patch here with a gray, was actually built on work tailings. And this was an innovative solution. I don't think we'd ever in anywhere in the world uh, built the tailings facilities on peat to utilize the peat actually as a, as a uh, uh, capture of metals, uh, another part uh, underneath our, our lining to help ensure that there would actually be no toxic metal release. And we worked with Board Namona on that and a number of peat experts from around the world. So we were proactive with the permitting process. Um, EISs came into Ireland due to European regula regulations in 1989, the year before the discovery. And the JV began its EIS in 1991, less than a year after discovery and, and basically two years after it was required in the country. Now EPA, the actual EPA agency, was established in Ireland in 1992, so a year after the discovery. And the joint venture, but really Chevron, worked with the new EPA to ensure that the regulations they put in place for Lachine and other mining operations actually met or exceeded those that were in place in the United States at the time. Um, the Lachine project was the first major project of any type to be considered by the Irish EPA. And I just want to, this is a paper that was published by two then government officials in 1998. Um, and it explains that the completion of the EIS, um, the planning and the IPCL applications were submitted in 1996, following extensive and mutually beneficial process of consultation with regulatory authorities and local interests. The developers have been very proactive with local residents and there's very little significant opposition. Basically, the, the, the planning permission through for Lachine went through in record time. So this history, uh, what, what we did in the joint venture might seem like standard practice today. I mean, this is the sort of thing that everybody should do, right? But I can tell you at the time leading it, it was not standard practice. And I had incredible pushback from both Chevron and our joint venture partners um, because we were so proactive with the locals and the government officials. But the end result um, really did show the value of transparency. So, you know, that's the reason people are doing these things today. But the point of my talk is, the question is, what should we be doing now in 2021 with minerals projects that will seem normal for raw materials projects in 2050? So 30 years ago, what we did at Lachine, I'm very proud of it. I think it was, it was something that was 
just coming on board with companies. Um, it is now standard practice and we go beyond it. But one of the things should we go be going way beyond now, looking to the future to make sure we can answer the questions that Andy had in his last talk. So thanks for listening and thank you, Sarah. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much for that, Murray. A massive, massive round of applause from all of us on the other side of our muted microphones. That was brilliant. And wow, talk about a whistle-stop tour through a phenomenal case study. Um, I think um, anybody who is studying geology or anything like that at university or mining at university, uh, what Murray has just achieved in 10 minutes, that was a brilliant case study. Um, and um, we've got a couple of questions, actually, Murray, that are coming in. Um, one that comes in from Haluk and Haluk asks, um, related to social management during um, the operation of the mine, um, it's not necessarily rate, related to your topic. So you can tell that I haven't yeah. actually read this question yet, but let's go for it. Um, in the history of Lachine, there were two big accidents during the operation, and this was really important for planning during the life of mine. So, by the way, everybody, LOM means life of mine, of mine yeah. um, in terms of that. So, after these accidents, were there any was there any impact for management of social consciousness? Um, and if so, how was this managed? So, I guess you got that linkage between the safety and the social consciousness there. Well, let me say that I left the project in 1993, so I wasn't involved in the mine itself. I certainly followed what was happening, and I, and I remember those two accidents well, even though I was in the United States. Um, from what I understand and what I know of the people at the mine, yes, both were taken incredibly seriously, and, and big safety reviews were conducted to try and understand you know, what had happened and why. Um, I must say that's that's typical these days at mining operations, so it's not unusual. Um, I, I wasn't in the local community, so I, I don't know what happened locally, but I am sure, well, I know most of them, both, both accidents had real impact, yes. Brilliant, thank, thank you for that, Murray. And I guess actually building on that as well, um, because very often with regards to safety, we're all told, you know, you all have a right to stop if you think that things look unsafe, etc. But often it takes a lot of guts to be able to do the right thing rather than just to conform to what everybody else is doing round about you. And I guess that's yep. actually what you guys were doing when you were setting Lachine up, is that you had to actually go beyond perhaps the norm to do things right. Um, and I guess with regards to that, so I think you noted that the EPA, um, so the Environmental Protection Agency was only set up after discovery. So it was, have you got any more examples or any comments with regards to how far you guys had to go outside of the normal boundaries actually to do this thing right? So that's where Chevron really was nervous, as you can imagine, um, because I was trying to get people from the United States who knew about these things to talk to people in Ireland about what the experiences were, so how Ireland could jumpstart and go right to the, the front of the queue in terms of their environmental regulations. Um, I'm very proud we did that, um, but but yeah, that was pretty edgy at the time. <laughs> and, and I guess that's something as well, especially in a big company like Chevron, there's almost more to lose in a way if they do something a little bit outside of the norm for one particular project, the cross impacts across to their other operations and projects might be quite significant. It could be, and this is where you need to have one, a good boss who trusts you. And two, at that time, I was very, very proud of Chevron. Um, we had the CEO come over to visit Lachine twice during this period. And um, having that sort of visibility in the company, he wanted it done right. So, you know, um, yeah, it can be done. So big companies can be both a problem and a real advantage. It can work both ways. Right. Yeah. And I guess that talks to quite a lot of what we heard yesterday from the likes of Elaine and Ludovine by saying, actually, leadership need to lead by example. And if you're saying something like safety or whatever um, is the number one priority, then you've got to mean it. Um, and you've yeah. got to be able to empower your entire workforce and beyond to be able to live that. Yep. Uh, so. Brilliant. Um, there's so many more questions, Murray, um, that I could ask you just from my list of questions. Um, but um, unfortunately, or fortunately, we need to move yep. on to the wonderful next speaker. So ladies and gents, please put your hands together for the wonderful Murray Hitzman. So round of applause. Thank you very much, Murray. Brilliant.